please welcome to the stage the president of the University of Washington, Anamari Kause. Well, welcome everybody. It's so wonderful to be here in community and I can assure you that there also is a very large community that is streaming in and uh, watching us from their homes or parties or um, wherever they are in communities. This is the annual university faculty lecture and I don't want to embarrass Valerie too much, but it is a big deal. This is the biggest honor that faculty give to other faculty. It is a real sign that our faculty recognizes the importance of your work and um, that recognizes that your work is a gift that you give to our entire community. So this, let, let, let's do a round of applause at the very beginning. And it is truly my pleasure to introduce Professor of Directing and Acting, Valerie Curtis Newton. She's the Head of Directing and Playwriting for the UW School of Drama, and she's Artistic Director of the Hansberry Project, a professional black theater company. She's innovative, she's creative, she's inspiring, and uh, she knows of what she speaks because she is brave. And I'm really excited to have her share tonight to learn from her about the role of courage in art. Now, when you think about it, um, some of us have had our moments on stage um, for one reason or another, and putting a performance on stage is always an act of vulnerability. You are there, people see you. Um, if it's you know, on stream, they see every little zit and every little line. Um, you know, all your mistakes are right out there. And no one understands that more than Valerie. She said, and I'm gonna quote, theater's fundamental function is to put us in relationship with one another, inspiring a sense of community. And that is something that we need now more than ever. But making connections with others requires courage and a willingness to be vulnerable, to be open, to be sometimes rejected. It means to build community means that we share our needs and that takes courage as well as we need to be considerate of the needs of others. As a teacher and artist, Valerie draws out that vulnerability from her students. She gives them permission and helps them become vulnerable. As performers, helping to forge those communal bonds that give our lives meaning. And after years of pandemic, this ongoing reckoning that we are, that we, I mean, there are gifts to this pandemic, and one of them is that it has pushed us into having an ongoing reckoning with the impact of systemic racism. Strengthening, and so strengthening that sense of community is more important now, and really building that inclusive community um, that, quite frankly, wasn't so great before the pandemic, and we need to come back and make it stronger than ever. Um, these traumas that we've all experienced, um, some a lot more than others, but all of us have had experiences that have been uh, very, very difficult, and they frayed our bonds. Um, there's no question about it. We're all trying to figure out exactly how we interact. We've lost some of that art of interaction. And it's gonna take courage to rebuild the connections that suffered when we were isolated. And art is absolutely crucial to helping us make sense of our stories and the stories of others. Telling stories bravely, taking risks, being vulnerable through art is essential to that process. And Valerie's perspective on that will be invaluable. I know we will all learn so much. She earned her BA from the College of Holy Cross, and she's a UW alum, having earned her MFA from the University of Washington. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including from the National Endowment for the Arts, 
the Stage Directors and, Choreographer, and Choreographers Foundation, and the Theater of Puget Sound. She's directed projects for many professional companies, and she served as artistic director for the Performing Ensemble of, Har of Hartford and the Ethnic Cultural Theater right here at the UW. She's the Donald E. Peterson Fellow, and in 2020, the Seattle Times named her one of the most influential citizens of the decade. So we are really lucky to have her here as our university faculty lecturer, Professor Valerie Curtis Newton. The stage is yours. Thank you. Wow. That was quite an introduction. Um, I appreciate it very, very much. I want to thank all of my colleagues for the, uh, this honor and the opportunity. I think it's an honor to be asked to speak and an even greater honor that all of you have chosen to come and listen. I'd like to apologize to the ASL translators because I sent you a draft of something I said I was going to say most of it I'm going to say, but I went to black church, so it's possible that I'll end up somewhere I didn't intend. If the spirit <laughs> hits me, I'm just going to go with it. Um, so the academic in me could give you a lot of history from Africa to the African Grove to Broadway last week. But uh, instead, I'm going to get, take you on a journey that is part personal and part research talk. Because my work is a reflection of my own personal philosophy that, as Alice Childress wrote, we must go further and do better. I believe that we can. And so I ask tough, honest, and I hope compassionate questions to keep us moving forward. How did I become this kind of question asker? I'm going to just do a little thing for you right now. My father is a retired magician, which accounts for my irregular behavior because everything comes out of magic hats or bottles with no bottoms, and parakeets are as easy to get as a couple of rabbits or three 50-cent pieces. 1958, my daddy retired from magic and took up another trade because this friend of mine from the third grade asked to be made white on the spot. But what could any self-respecting colored American magician do with such an outlandish request except put all them razzmatazz, hocus pocus, zippity doodah thingamajigs away because colored children believing in magic was becoming politically dangerous for the race. And wasn't nobody going to be made white just from the <laughs> clap of my daddy's hands. The reason I'm so peculiar is I've been studying up on my daddy's technique. And everything I do is magic these days. It's very colored. Very, now you see it, now you don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. I come from a family of retired sorcerers, active hongkongs, and penny anti fortune tellers with 41 million spirit critters and celestial bodies on our side. I'll listen to your problems, help with your career, your lover, your wandering spouse, make your grandma stay in heaven more gratifying, ease your mama through menopause, and show your son how to clean his room. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Three wishes is all you get. Scarlet ribbon for your hair, Benoit balls via Hong Kong, a miniature Machu Picchu. All things are possible. But ain't no colored magician in her right mind going to make you white. I mean, this is black magic you looking at. And I'm fixing you up good, good and colored. And you're going to be colored all your life. And you're going to love it being colored all your life. Colored and love it. Love it being colored. That's an excerpt from Entezaki Shange's Spell Number 7 from Up North, Out West, Geechee, Jabara, Quick Magic Trans Manual for Technologically Stressed Third World People. You might recognize her name as from her more famous work, 
for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. That sister loved a long title. She plays a special part in my journey. I'll tell you more about this later, but let's start at the beginning of my personal foundation, the seeds of my voice and personal mission. My father wasn't really a magician, at least not in the literal sense. In fact, he was retired from the Air Force, but maybe in a more figurative way, he was. I mean, he was a black man trying to survive in America, which does require a kind of magic. My father had a complicated relationship with this country. He, like Oprah Winfrey, believed that excellence overcomes racism. He had stories of the things he had endured on his journey, and he wanted me to learn from them and be ready to, for them if they happened to me. He instilled in me a desire to be excellent. He would gently drill me on my inherent worth and the potential excellence that lived within me. He would ask me my opinions and debate current affairs at dinner. He didn't go easy on me. Uh, uh, I learned to make an argument debating my father. I've never had an intellectual debate with anyone tougher than he was. He also inspired a curiosity in me, a desire both to solve questions and to question everything. I spent a lot of time alone as I was an Air Force kid reading. We traveled a lot. Or maybe I was just that introverted kid who found something comforting in quiet solitude. But by the time I was 13, I had read all of Maya Angelou, which led me to Shakespeare and Poe. I loved the loftiness of the language. I had also read Letters from a Birmingham Jail, the autobiography of Malcolm X, and Soul on Ice. Challenging forces around us seemed so powerful to me. But I knew that challenging and questioning would come with a price. Though young, I had been alive to see the deaths of Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King. Despite my father's best efforts, I knew deep inside that excellence was no protection from racism and discrimination. In watching my father, I learned that I had to be so secure in who I was and what I believed that I could stand through the storms, bend but not break. In church, they would say, just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. To stand through the storm, you have to have a belief in something bigger than you are. Maya Angelou has a poem called Song for the Old Ones. The final lines are, they've laughed to shield their crying and then shuffled through their dreams and stepped and fetched a country to write the blues with screams. I understand their meaning. It could and did derive from living on the edge of death. They kept my race alive. When I read that poem, I decided that was my something bigger. It would be a commitment not to be broken. That would be my way of paying back all the elders and paying forward for those who would come after me. I reached into the history of my people and found example after example of folks who looked at what seemed impossible and found a way forward. They used to say in church, nowhere in the Bible does God ever tell anyone to retreat. The order is always go forth. That's what I've been trying to do for my 40 years in the theater, trying to keep the race alive, go forth and ask questions. Sean Kay, Sean Kay said it in the poem I did, I found my being colored and love it. I fell deeply in love with black people. And, and because I don't want to get into the Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter discussion, I'm going to just issue my standard Northwest disclaimer that when I say I love black people, it is not meant to diminish any other people, but to lift my people, to let our lessons and achievements shine for everyone to see and learn from, just as we should learn from those around us. 
And in the process of putting that love for black people on display, I've had the chance to do some work that others have found useful. And that makes me, and I hope my father and the elders, proud. I love to quote the wisdom of the elders. James Baldwin once said, you, ha you have to decide who you are and force the world to deal with you, not its idea of you. So this is an example of what lo that looked like to me. I went to the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Mass. At 19, I encountered a theater department requirement that every actor was required to audition for the main stage production. All of the plays were by white male writers. In my year, it was Our Town by Thornton Wilder. The play is set in New England, in a New England town. So I decided to question the requirement. I went to the director and I said, if I am the best Emily Webb, will I be cast? She blanched. It's interesting when you ask straightforward, honest questions that hold people accountable for the things they say they believe, that blanching will happen. It's sort of indicative that you've hit the nerve, right? So we had a long talk. She had just taken on her job, and she was like, I'm not from New England, and I'm making this play for New Englanders, so I need to be true to what they believe New England to be. And I was like, but my family's been here since the 1700s. I know who I am. You have to deal with me or not deal with me, but you can't deny who I am. If I'm the best Emily, will I be cast? She said no. And she regretted it. She felt bad. She had all this I didn't mean stuff. But then she did something that a lot of people don't do when they're corrected. She said, I won't cast you, but I would like to invite you to be my assistant director. What that meant was I got to go backstage. I got to see pre-production. I got to ask questions. My own creativity, I got to express it to her. And she listened. It changed everything for me. I learned there that I was a director. Um, I will also say that she came to teach here at UW. And in the, early, the late 80s, early 90s, she directed a production of Our Town. It was, it was non-traditionally cast. Black George, white Emily. And she told me about it because she knew that I would care. It was also at Holy Cross that I first met Entozaki Shange. She was signing copies of the book for colored girls who've considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. And I was awestruck. I was awestruck. So I was in my line, and I had the little book, and I was like, and I went up to her and I said, this, this book is so powerful. And my friends and I, we did monologues from it. I love to make art, to make theater, but I go to a predominantly white school and they don't get it. And she said, I hear that, making art is hard. And then she inscribed my book, with, which is something that is very powerful to me even to this day. She signed it, inscribed it. To be an artist is sometimes to be outside the people and closer to God. I told you she had a special place in my story. Um, when I got out of graduate school, when I got out of undergrad, I, went, I met an amazing group of artists in Hartford. They had started a group called the Performing Ensemble. And we did plays in church fellowship halls, raised money to tour devised pieces that we also called Choria poems, like Miss Shangate. The pieces combined history, monologues, poetry, music. We played in our church hall home and around New England, everywhere from schools to festivals to church events, anywhere we were asked to perform, be, to perform, we went. 
We moved among our communities and across boundaries. It was a glorious time for me as a young artist. I had all these examples of people who loved black people as much as I did and wanted to give a part of the art to them. And so we went around and did that. They, they did put up this play that I didn't like. Because why? Because I was 22 and knew everything. So they did a play called Living Fat, which is about money. And it was a satirical look at money. And it had a kind of minstrel-esque quality to it that I did not appreciate. And I told them so. I asked the question, um, do we really think living fat is the, the thing we want to do with our resources? But rather than what my professor did, they pushed back. They said, well, why don't you direct the next show and tell us what you think we should be putting up? So they called my bluff. It was my job then to do something. I picked Alice Childress's Wine in the Wilderness. It's an amazing play, and if you're unfamiliar with it, I challenge you right now to go and look it up. Um, it's a play that takes on class within race, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. So then, uh, in my own journey, I come to the University of Washington, where you know, in Seattle, there is no such thing as racism. <laughs> go ahead, you can laugh. Um, when I arrived here in 93, I already knew what kind of artist I wanted to be. I didn't quite know how to be it, but I knew what kind of artist I wanted to be. I knew that I would have to make a way to continue my tra trajectory to tell black stories. But one of the head of the directing program at that time suggested that I might want to stop doing black plays because he already knew that I could do them. My heart broke a little. But then I thought, Ben, don't break. And I told them that if he, if he could tell me what he thought I should know, I would find the material from which to learn it. And we kept that deal for my whole time here. He didn't try to change me. He, made space for me to learn new skills and apply them to my own artistic voice. I like to hope that's the kind of teacher I am, that I can teach the students the courage to have something to say and then support them in developing the craft to say it excellently. I'm not always successful, but that's my goal. I had another, another class as a grad student and I know that there are grad students and professors in this room who will recognize this kind of example. I was taking a class with actors, directors, and designers, and the professor started the, pl the class with the Greeks. And he went from the Greeks into Western European theater and basically was telling us there was nothing else. So midway through the quarter, I did what? I asked a question. That's all I do, I just ask questions. The question I asked was, are there no non-Western roots of theater that merit study? And he said no. And then he said he taught the way he was taught. My uh, fellow graduate students were all aghast. Because again, that Northwest liberal mentality kicked in. And they were fussing at him and fussing at him. And I just stopped them and I said, did anyone not hear him say that he does not have what we're asking for? Why beat him up for what he doesn't have? Our charge now is to find what we need and infuse it into every assignment he gives us. So then what happened is my uh, adaptation of the Oresteia. It happens in Los Angeles in 1992 after the race riots, the, Rod the Rodney King riots. And I decide that I want to focus on the 
the issues between the police and the black community and the tensions between the black community and the Korean community. And so he just played around with all of those themes and developed a whole big proposal about what that could be. It definitely opened the room to a completely different discussion and everybody learned something, including that professor. I was not trying to say that I knew more than him. I just knew differently than he did. I knew a piece of theater history that he did not know. I knew about Ethiopia. I knew about the ritual uh, theaters of pretty much any indigenous people anywhere around the globe. I knew that stuff. And I could share it with him. The reason I sort of stepped in with my classmates was belittling him and attacking him for what he didn't know wasn't going to help him develop a desire to know more. Questions were my way in. Um, you might say that, quoting another one of the elders, as James Brown would say, open up the door, I'll get it myself. It's been a model for a lot of my professional career. That was sort of my way of going forth. Between grad school to being on the faculty on to today, I've evolved a set of core beliefs that inform my process and my practice. Failure is a part of the process. You have to try to know. I use this in my rooms and I force my students to take it on as a mantra. That's a great idea, did you try it? No, I didn't think it would. Go back and try it. Tell me what it really meant. Tell me why it didn't really work. The second one is uh, about fearlessness. It's a red herring. Everyone is afraid most of the time. Just accept that as a fact. Look around at the people next to you in this room right now. If I asked you to come up here, everyone would be afraid, right? We're all afraid most of the time. We have to fear the fe feel the fear and do it anyway. We have to be brave. We have to have courage, the courage to try. The next one is safe space is a pipe dream. I really don't believe that there is a, such a thing as a safe space. Whenever I have, those are the times when the microaggression or the macroaggression has hurt me most deeply. When I think I'm safe here, I'm actually at my most vulnerable, most capable of being hurt. But if I say I'm brave enough to be in a situation that is not safe, and know that if something happens, I will not die. I don't need to be safe, I need to be brave, and I will not die. It makes a huge difference to be able to go there. My teaching goal and my practice in the rehearsal room is to basically put brave people into every space. Honest conversations are hard, but without them, nothing gets done, and we end up in the same place we started, just a little poorer and a little more frustrated. In 2004, I was approached by Kurt Beatty of A Contemporary Theater about the idea of curating some shows for ACT Theater. And I told him, no, I didn't want to curate shows. I didn't want to be paid to put black bodies in his theater space. But that I would partner with him in order to make a relationship that would allow us to do work that would open up the doors to more people. Um, so in 2006, um, I founded the Hansberry Project with my partner in art, Vivian Phillips. It was named after Lorraine Hansberry because she was a shining example of being, what it is to be both an artist and an activist. We sought to make change by promoting the theater at the Hansberry Project, we present black plays because we're committed to the idea that of an American theater that accurately reflects the richness and diversity of American life. 
From initial, initial sketches to fully realized productions, the Hansberry Project promotes and supports black theater artists in diverse, of diverse interests and disciplines, speaking on a range of themes and working in various styles. We are all uniquely positioned in our community to provide a context for this work, placing it in the historical continuum of black artists in the American theater. The mission is to celebrate, support, and present the work of black theater artists. Our ultimate vision is a community in which the voices of black theater artists artfully expressing their op observations, investigations, hopes, and dreams are an integral part of a rich, full-throated civic dialogue. Um, we entered into a partnership with ACT Theater, and as a kind of incubator, they would host us for main stage plays, one in each season, and we could use their spaces for other events. We were there for five years, and then we would reassess. We did a production called Flight as a kind of run at it we, to see how things would go. We called it the engagement party. We weren't fully married by then, but we were leaning towards some time of long-term commitment. Um, so here is a clip from that production. This is a dark time. But we're going to bring light to this dark. That's what we're going to do. Right here. And right now. Say it out.
So that was flight. And then we actually committed to each other, and the Hansberry Project was born. Our first production was a, the play by Alice Childress, Wine in the Wilderness. And um, it shifted something for us because we were very clear that we did not want to make a white black dynamic the center of our work. White people are present. They're a part of our given circumstances, but they are not the heart of our drama, not the heart of our lives. And so we did this play that was about class and race, what it's like to be the educated one or to be the less educated one. Um, we wanted to privilege the black lens. And so we did that with every production that we made in our five years at ACT. These are some of the other uh, projects that we did. In conjunction with most of these projects, we also did a, had a community component. So with uh, Wine in the Wilderness, we had a Juneteenth gala festival to educate more people about Juneteenth. And now, you know, Juneteenth is a federally recognized national holiday. It wasn't back then. There was a lot of controversy about it because there, there was a sect of people who were like, well, why are we having a celebration of the fact that we were duped for two years into continuing to be enslaved in Texas. Why do you want to have a party for that? But we said we're not celebrating the, the, the duplicitousness and the con. We're actually celebrating the emancipation. So these are some of the projects that we did at ACT. And um, then we left ACT and started to do things more around the city. We became the Hansberry Project at other uh, theaters around the city. The idea was, once we left ACT, we didn't have that, um, that edifice from which to work. We needed to adjust and find a new way to work. You know, the idea of making lemonade from lemons. We were not gonna be stopped. We were gonna morph, adapt, and keep pushing, go forth. Bend, but don't break. So we began to take our little meager funds and to grow them, and then to incentivize smaller theaters around Seattle to take on the work of black writers. So Brokeology, Sunset Baby, there, there's, a, there, there's a list of more. These are all the different productions that the Hansberry Project sponsored through other organizations around the city. And what happened, interestingly enough, was the productions that we supported highlighted the work of black theater artists and became a kind of showcase for black talent here in Seattle. So no one could say anymore they didn't know where the black actors were. They didn't know, any. just name any of the questions that they were no longer able to say they didn't know. And I think that's a really important element of advancing and moving forward, is to eliminate the excuse you didn't know. So when you encounter it, even as a student, when you encounter a situation that something feels wrong, you need to ask questions. You need to be brave enough to ask questions. Eliminate the excuse that we didn't know it was a microaggression. May, may you eliminate the excuse by willing to step up and say, did you know that was a microaggression? An example I would give you is that I was in the, the room with a, the, the board of one of the theaters that I was participating with, and they were doing season planning, and I said to them, does it bother anybody here that all of these proposed titles are by white men? I didn't stand on the desk. I didn't beat my breast and say, how dare you? And, I just said, does it bother anybody? And someone said, no. And I was like, OK. Just like that professor, you don't have what I need, so I have to go somewhere else to get it. I don't need you to change, but I need you to hear that your word and your action are not in line. The integrity is not consistent. So what Hansberry began to do was to feed microgrants. Um, Anamari, if you were making a production and you needed an equity actor and you didn't have it in your budget, we'd pay the health and benefits and you just pay the salary per week. 
Uh, LaShonda, if you needed a designer, I would give you money to hire a black designer. So that's how we began to see these productions to elevate the, the idea of the presence of black talent. And we're still doing that today. Um, we started the Multicultural uh, Playwrights Festival called Represent, and we did that for 10 years. Um, part of it was at ACT, where we had a facility. We invited other ethnically specific theaters to join together to make work with us. And then when we moved away from ACT, we started doing that festival around the city in different places. Um, we do a lot of community readings. These are all uh, readings that have to do with uh, violence against black people, particularly police violence. But we've also done other, other reading series. LaShonda, was, we were just talking about 2016, the Hansberry Project did a summit featuring the work of black women writers. Um, so those were all readings. Then in um, 2020, we introduced something called The Drinking Gourd. It's a joint project with True Colors Theater of Atlanta, Georgia, that commissioned writers to write short plays that were then produced in Zoom readings. Um, at that time, that was the scope of what we could do. Now we're go going to phase two, which will have us creating rolling premieres of commissioned work so that a, a piece will be able to have workshop per per performances, productions, developmental productions until it reaches a place of being ready for full production of its own. I'm gonna blow through a bunch of stuff right now. Just these are some examples of my, my directing work. In 2011, I did a primarily black production of All My Sons at the Intamon. Kate Wariski asked me if I had a way to make that play not a museum piece. And I thought, well, if we put these words in the mouths of black people without changing them, we will see if in fact this message is universal because that's a big thing people say they want work to be, is universal. I think that's a crock, but that's what they say. So we did it, we did this production, we didn't change a word, well, we did change one word. I just really couldn't get with the idea of black people eating rhubarb, so <laughs> we went from rhubarb pie to peach cobbler. <laughs> just, you know, trying to be honest. Um, uh, we did that production and then I did something, some would call it brave, some would call it stupid. I went on a, part of a, a community panel on the, the Mikado and the idea of yellow face. And I got on stage at the rep and I said, I didn't want to talk about racism anymore because it had become a kind of pastime where they would invite people of color up to, op to open a vein about all the bad things that have happened to us. So the white people could say, oh, this is so terrible. And then I got my sort of Toni Morrison moment. I said, racism is white people's problem. And I don't want to come up here again until you all have an idea about what you want to do about it. Then I'm happy to participate in another forum, but until then, I don't want to talk about this anymore. So the immediate reaction to that was everybody wanted to talk to me about race when I said I didn't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> um, suddenly, that was the only thing I could be interviewed about. Um, so I did that, and uh, it stuck for a long time that I didn't want to talk about race um, because white people need to fix it. Then I did another Alice Childress play. My goal, some people talk about wanting to do all the August Wilson plays. Mine was to do all the Alice Childress plays. So in 2013, I directed Trouble in Mind at the Entomon, and in 2016, I directed it at the Guthrie. The interesting thing about the Guthrie production, you talk about asking questions. Um, I had a student who saw my production at the Entomon. She was in Minneapolis. She heard that they were thinking of doing a play in Minneapolis, and she said to me, 
Um, you know how you're telling us if we want to have our work out in the world, we should be aggressive about putting it out there. I think you should tell the Guthrie that you want to direct Trouble in Mind. And I was like, well, ouch. So I called a friend who was working there at the time. And she said, yeah, there's a new artistic director. You might want to reach out to him. And so I did that. And then he checked a couple of my references and said yes. And I didn't know it at the time, but their saying yes made me the first black woman to direct a main stage play at the Guthrie in what was at that time 45 years. Again, it's that thing about asking the question, finding the right question and asking it. So that's my trouble in mind story. Father Comes Home from the Wars. I just directed this for the UW, but I directed it in New Orleans. The, the interesting thing about this was when I directed it, there was all this charge to get rid of the Confederate statues. They were taking down Robert E. Lee's circle. So we're doing this play about the Confederacy and about what it meant to be black in the South during the Civil War while they were discussing whether or not to take down those monuments. We were a part of a conversation in that community that was really, really palpable and where it was uh, intentional and powerful. Motherfucker with a hat. Um, this is one of the first times I was asked to direct a not black play. And I knew what it felt like for the Latine uh, artists in town to have someone else directing a work out of their culture because it happens to me all the time as a black person. This is the, the trifecta. This is the third of the Alice Childress plays. Um, it completed something for me, but it also showed how nothing has changed. The play was written in 1965. Trouble in Mind was written, I mean, uh, uh, Wine in the Wilderness was written in 68. Trouble in Mind was written in 54, and it's all still the same message. We haven't gotten it, nothing changes. Dominique Morisot, the year I directed this play, she was named uh, MacArthur Genius. Then I did um, Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill at Arts West. What excited me about this production is that we basically gutted the theater and put in cafe tables and turned it into a nightclub. So environmentally, it just felt different. Um, and Felicia Loud killed it. So I don't know if any of you saw Nina Simone Four Women at Seattle Rep in 2019. Um, it's based on Nina Simone's fa famous song. At the end of the, for me, the question of this play was, how do we write this artist into the, the landscape and historical record of activist artists. So this, on the first day of rehearsal, we get these books and we, I, uh, I don't write in mine, I write on post-its. So I accumulated the post-its for the whole rehearsal period. That's what my desk in rehearsal looks like. These post-its, um, at the end of the play, there's a big screen that drops down, and it has all these names of, of women, historically, who, do, who use their art for larger, larger purposes. And so um, we, we listed probably 50 names. And then we invited people to write on post-its the names of people in their lives and their community who they would identify as activists in their communities. So this was just the first night. That's closing night. There are a lot of folks out there who are doing good work. And the opportunity to celebrate them and to lift them up was part of what the play was about for me. I did a play, a little play at West of Lenin called The Agitators. And it's a two-handed play about Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass and the arg arguments over suffrage. It's a really beautiful play. I started it when um, it was in development. It was being worked on in Rochester, which is where Susan B. Anthony papers are, and her house was there. And um, as we were working through the script, I said to the writer, does it bother you, my famous question, 
that Frederick Douglass is underrepresented in this play. And he like perked up and he's like, well, I've gotten so much more research on her because I'm here. And I said, great, so maybe we should get some more Frederick Douglass research. And in the end, it became a, a battle royale intellectually between the two of them. And I was really proud of what Matt did with that question and how far the work came in its development. Um, last night and the night before, I did it at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. And it was the first play I had done that had a queer uh, plot, queer characters. And as a queer woman, queer black woman myself, the opportunity to tell that story, that intersectional story, was really, really powerful for me. And to work with a queer writer and to tell some truths about our lives and our families was also a really powerful thing. Again, asking questions. So this is the pandemic. This is me directing in the pandemic. That's me in my office at home on a Zoom platform, like platform, with actors in Maryland. They were in the theater space with a crew being tested at, for COVID every day. And, um, I was, had the script, and then I had these three cameras, and I was staging through the cameras to the live space. In the end, I was still making theater. If I had made it on the digital platform, I'm not sure I would have called it theater, because it misses the live component, which for me is so important. So I'm just going to play. So right now I'm working on a piece with Reggie Jackson for ACT Theater. And um, I, mean, I didn't show you a lot of historical images at the beginning, but there are some here that I would <laughs> just show you and um, I'll let Shonda and I have a talk. Um, I was asked when I won, was granted the Genius Award, I was asked to create a piece of art that would go into the Fry Museum. And I was like, what? I make plays. I don't make, I'm not an artist like that. I'm not a visual artist. Um, but they said I could make whatever I wanted. So I decided to write a manifesto and I reached out to past students and colleagues and said, if I've ever said anything that was useful to you, can you say it back to me? And I got all of these DMs and messages on Facebook, and I put them on a, a manifesto. And I'm going to leave this up while I invite LaShonda Pittman to the stage. Thank you so much for coming. I know I went a little long, but I had a lot to say.
say that that was amazing as an understatement. It's such an honor to be on the stage with you again at this stage of both of our careers. Um, let's thank Valerie Curtis Newton one more time for this incredible. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Always bring the wisdom. Um, I'm LaShonda Pittman. I'm an assistant professor in American Ethnic Studies. I've had the privilege of knowing Valerie for years now. <laughs> um, I've probably seen at least a dozen of either your plays or the plays that have come out of the Hansberry Project. We've broken bread, lots, restaurants throughout Seattle, and in your own home with the fabulous Soul Food Meal. Um, we did the Q&A for the Hansberry uh, Project's Black Woman Wisdom Summit, which was insane, amazing. You hit me to Hedgebrook, where I'm also now an alum. So thank you for that. And for me, I think as with so many others, your very presence has helped ground me in blackness in my time here in Seattle. So thank you. I'll be moderating the Q&A portion of the evening. We've already received some questions for the audience and for those of you watching at home, of which there are many, I've been told. Um, and those of you in the room with us, feel free to email your questions to questions at uw.edu. I'm going to go with the first question, which is something that you alluded to um, that I was really moved by. You talked about not retreating and going forth and your core beliefs and even sort of the last slide that you shared. Over the years, I've watched you pull back the layers of creativity, of vulnerability, and of discovery over and over again, despite whatever you were facing to bring your work to fruition, but also, I would say importantly, to help others do the same. What advice do you have for artists and researchers in the early stages of their work, whether they're new artists or researchers or whether they're starting a new project, um, to keep at that process of pulling back those layers, even in the face of um, struggle, including what we or others may perceive as failure? Yeah. What I'm reminded of, and you've heard me say this before, the fact is when I get to wherever I'm going, I want to be who I am. So that means I have to actually defend those boundaries. I have to do what's right for me inside my boundaries. Um, that, that doesn't mean being uh, mm, aggressive, unnecessar unnecessarily aggressive. It just means being clear and direct and honest. That's, that's my advice in terms of going forward, is to know what you will accept and know what you won't accept, mm -hmm. and to have your own bottom line. Because when you know what your bottom line is, what you'll walk away from, you have power. Yeah. You have power. Yeah. Just tell them, you know, I'm not doing that. There might be consequences, but as I said, you won't die. Right. Yeah, thank you. The next question comes from a viewer named Stephen. Stephen would like to know, how do you think that we can explore the psychology of oppressive ideologies in artistic works <laughs> in an age when the public seems allergic to any representation of them in the public square? Do you want me to repeat that? Feel the fear and do it anyway. Feel the fear and do it anyway. I mean, that sounds flip, but I, I believe it's true. I believe that if we keep making work, people have to deal with the work. If we stop making work, then they don't have to deal with it. So um, asking hard questions, being willing to get or to do the extra work that you might have to do because the people you're asking to change they're often ill-equipped to do it. So how do you move forward anyway? How do you make lemonade? 
right? It's, it, it sounds really simple, but it does require a kind of courage to say, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna challenge this, I'm gonna show this, and some people are gonna love it and some people are gonna hate it. When I did the thing with all my sons and did predominantly black production, people called me every kind of bigot and racist there ever was. Mm. They came for me like I stole something from them. And then I realized I did, I stole their privilege. I stole their sense of ownership. No wonder they were upset. And they deserved to be upset. And I needed to let them deal with their upsetness. They were entitled to have their feelings about what they encountered. But I didn't have to take it back. Right? So that's the thing is how do you go forth? Bend but don't break. How do you define yourself for yourself and stay yourself? Thank you. I feel like this is a little bit of a related question. This is from another uh, person who submitted a question. Uh, what did you learn from directing Selling Kabul, a very thought-provoking play? Yeah, Selling Kabul, I think it's another one of those plays where um, my own cultural experience was not at the center. It's a play about the translators left behind in Afghanistan when the US pulled out. Mm. Um, so I cast actors who had that lived, the lived experience of that culture, and we hired a cultural consultant. And then I applied my craft as a director to their story, and I checked in with them about its authenticity. Um, and I accepted that because their cultures, like mine, is not monolithic, no matter how much checking and advising I did, I was going to get it wrong. There's going to be someone who says, well, that I'm Afghan and that's not what we do. I did my best. I took my best shot. I got as much advice as I could. I made decisions. I made the art. The art is well made. I can stand behind the well made art and take the heat. I think this actually feeds in really nice with the next question, which is which addresses issues of inclusion and diversity. We know that it's important not only for black people to see themselves represented in your both what you produce and you as the producer of that work. Um, I love to also hear you talk about why it's important for others to learn, hear from, and see from your perspective. Yeah. I think the prevalence of stereotypes, the problem is the two-dimensionality of them. And that what, what the theater can do is when it's well done, it can reflect the full three-dimensional humanness of a culture. It can um, show its best, show its pain, show its hurt, show its joy, um, show its excellence, show its failures. Um, and it's not doesn't have to be just one flat image. And I think that's true, actually, of representing any culture. But I especially feel it about black people, because the history of flattening and what white supremacy did to our culture, has done to our culture, is so needs so much repair and restoration that um, that's, why, that's why representation is important. I love the historical slides. I'm hoping my students in black digital studies who are watching can kind of integrate that into what we're doing in that class. Um, we have a new question from Usha. Fabulous talk and delivery. I am overwhelmed. Are there any black plays about happiness? Which, speaking to white supremacy and the impact on blackness. Listening to you, I felt hopeful, and I wonder if there is if this feeling can be expressed or the plays have all to be, have to do with struggle? Hmm. There are lots of black plays about happiness. There are a lot of them. Um, the best of them actually still indicate struggle, but there is survival and joy in how we overcome, and that's to be celebrated. I think that the idea that, you know, 
that we don't want to see struggle because we live struggle is true and to a certain extent this is not going to be popular. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little reductive. Right? In our fullness, the fullness of our humanity, we do all those things. So all of them should be reflected on the stage. And some of the most joyful shows I have ever been to also demonstrated deep pain and overcoming. But one of the gifts of our history is that we can overcome and overcome with joy. So yeah. I think both things, they, two things can be true at the same time. Absolutely. Reminds me of your play, um, The Card Party. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you actually said, I don't need to be safe, I need to be brave. I feel like that could be a bumper sticker, like t shirt, all the things. Um, resistance, disruption have been important to getting where you are. For others for whom that will be and is the case, can you provide some insight into how you resource yourself, how you tap into other kinds of energy to do the incredible work that you do? My downtime is very important. When I open a show, as my wife can attest, I then sleep for two days. I do my best not to answer the phone. And there's a reason that I have 42,000 emails. Yes. I just don't deal with them. Um, and I would say the other part of it is as long as I can stay focused on something bigger than me, I could go on and on and on and on. When it becomes about me, then it's very difficult to make my work. But will, will they think I'm a good director? Will they think I'm smart? Will they think I'm all of those things? Then it's hard to get up for the work. But when I think about you know, expressing this love for black culture, this um, desire to see it flourish, it's a lot easier to get up every day and go do the work when it's bigger than me, which is in a way what all those grandmamas used to say in church. Last question. Um, I think it's the one that I'm the most excited about. It's my sort of what next question. So you've gotten to the mountaintop. After looking out from that place, what will you do in the next season of your life? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think you mentioned the rent party, but um, part of what I'm doing is writing more. Um, I've got a couple of plays that I'm working on in development. Um, and I keep thinking about, you know, this question of resilience and black art making, that maybe there's a book in there. You and I are going to make a play. So I, I'm going to be doing a lot more generative work, I think, while I continue to direct as I'm invited. Um, and eventually I will not be at the School of Drama, so I'll have more time. I'm not quitting tomorrow, but... <laughs> Day after, maybe. Anne Marie is like, no, I didn't come here for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, LaShonda. Thank you again, Valerie. This was incredibly inspiring. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us both in person and live. Um, this concludes our year's university faculty lecture, and um, we have a reception in the lobby for those of you who'd like to stay around and. Take Valerie's brain and heart just a little bit more. Thank you. <laughs>